Hello, college football fans, and welcome once again to the SEC Yesterday and Today. This is episode 11, and it is a special episode, an Iron Bowl edition, if you will, as will next week's podcast number 12 be. Yes, we're going to take a look at the Iron Bowl or the Alabama versus Auburn game if you're an Alabama fan or the Auburn versus Alabama game if you are an Auburn fan. Many of us don't uh, prefer referring to the game as the Iron Bowl, but that's become the game, the title of the game that most everybody refers to now. So that is what we'll use throughout these podcasts. But we are going to focus on the University of Alabama this week. We have a guest from Touchdown Alabama, uh, the magazine, and next week we will have an Auburn guest on and take two looks at the game from the different perspectives of the two rivals. But first of all, before we get into the heart of our program today, let's take a look back like we do on the podcast at yesterday. Some stats on the series. This game has been played 81 times. The University of Alabama has won 45 of those games. Auburn University, 35 games. One game, only one, has ended in a tie. The largest margin of victories. Auburn's 48 to nothing win in 1895 was their largest, and I might mention that in 1957, when Auburn won its first national championship, they defeated the University of Alabama 40 to nothing, and that was the year before Bear Bryant took over the helm of the Crimson Tide in 1958. Alabama's largest margin of victory occurred after the series resumed after a multi-year layoff. Alabama won that game 55 to nothing, yes, in 1948. The longest winning streaks, Alabama has a nine-game winning streak, which took place 1973 through 1981, and Auburn has a six-game winning streak that was under the tutelage of Tommy Tuberville. Six games, 2002 through 2007. Now some more stats on the series. Auburn claims two national championships. Alabama claims 15. Auburn has 12 conference championships. The University of Alabama, 30 conference championships. By the way, that is ninth all time in number of conference championships won uh, by the University of Alabama. Auburn has played in 41 bowl games. That ranks 16th all time. The University of Alabama has played in 66 bowl games. Did I say 141 ball games? Well, they have played in 41 ball games. Auburn has. uh, All-time wins. Auburn 764. That's 13th all-time. Alabama 888. That's 5th all-time. Auburn's bowl record is 23-16-2. That is 20th all-time. Alabama's bowl record is 37-25-3. That is 18th all-time. Consensus All-Americans for Auburn, 30. Alabama has had 68 consensus All-Americans over the years. Auburn has three Heisman winners. Alabama has two Heisman winners. First-round NFL draft picks, Auburn has 30, and Alabama has 57. And now we're going to get into our conversation with Stephen Smith of Touchdown Alabama Magazine and the Way It Is radio show on Fox Sports 97.9. And now we welcome Stephen Smith to our program today. Well, good day, Stephen. How are you today? Doing well, Bird. I'm very happy to be here on your show, a proud guest of this show for the first time, and just really amped up to talk about some Alabama-Auburn, some Iron Bowl action. Oh, yes, sir. And I'm an old school guy now. I go way back to uh, 1964 was my first Iron Bowl, and I sat in that uh, north end zone of Legion Field, and uh, we had Jimmy Seidel and Tucker Fredrickson on the Auburn side and Joe Namath and Ray Perkins on the uh, Alabama side, and that's something to remember. And I've, I guess I've seen about 40 of them since then. And uh, this is shaping up as another epic one, isn't it? Shaping up to be that way, uh, Auburn and Gus Malzahn really starting to turn it on offensively. Kevin Steele has been the money man as far as the defense is concerned, uh, doing a great job getting those guys to play fast. And on Alabama's end, just trying to withstand injuries and keep itself in the best possible spot. 
Now, uh, let's take it back uh, for just a few minutes to last week's game. And, you know, we'd, we'd, everybody at Auburn was tickled to death to dominate Georgia the way they did, and, and, and people are getting healthy, and everything finally seems to be coming into shape. Tell me about that uh, state game with Alabama a little bit. Uh, what went on there, your impressions of that, and uh, what Alabama's going to need to do this week to ready up for the Tigers? Uh, Bird, it was crazy. A lot of people did not expect Mississippi State to keep that one close or even, you know, take Alabama down to the wire, so to speak. But you have to give Dan Mullen, Todd Grantham, quarterback Nick Fitzgerald a lot of credit. Those guys really came to play last week. Dan Mullen, a perfect game plan, control the ball, control the clock, keep Alabama on the sideline as much as possible. Alabama defense, you really see where – the loss of four linebackers, including Sean Dion Hamilton, really hurts because Bulldogs able to run the ball up the middle with Aris Williams and Nick Fitzgerald. But despite it all, somehow Jalen Hurt, who for the second week in a row, put the team on his back, completed some clutch passes in marquee situations to assist Alabama, captain Alabama to winning that game 30 30- one to 24 a come from behind win gets a big touchdown pass to freshman Devonta Smith to kind of quiet those loud and crazy cowbells going on in Stark Vegas Davis Wade Stadium so people did not expect <laughs> this game to be that close but once again Dan Mullen has done an unbelievable job in Starkville since getting the job and I believe 2009 he's been able to mold quarterbacks he's finally got he's he finally has a defensive coordinator in Ty Grantham that's aggressive, that will take chances, that will affect the quarterback. And if State can continue to win, they end the year off, they end the year off at nine and three, which is a great, great mark for Dan Mullen. But for Alabama to be able to, despite the injuries, the struggles against State, and to win that game and the fashion of how they won that game speaks well on the character and the resiliency of Coach Saban and that football team. Oh yeah, yes it does. I didn't, uh, I didn't get to see a lot of it. I kept my eye on it, and so you, we were busy celebrating, going to tumors, and, and having a good time. But we, there was I mean, always a TV on somewhere. The dog was, on Georgia. <laughs> I, you know what? I don't think anybody expected that, but uh, somehow when I got up that morning, I, I had picked Auburn to win twenty three to twenty one. I really thought they had an excellent chance to win at home. I knew they were coming together, and Georgia had looked so good. They didn't show those uh, chinks in the armor really. Uh, that we didn't see it coming that they might uh, get beat like they did. But when I got up that morning, I almost went back on uh, media and said, you know what, I'm thinking now about this game that either uh, Georgia wins a very close game or Auburn uh, wins going away. I don't know why I got that feeling, but I did. But you could kind of feel it there. And uh, we haven't uh, had that kind of electricity at Jordan-Hare probably since four years ago uh, to kick six games. So it's uh, we're looking forward to this. This uh, this should, be, like I mentioned earlier, should be an epic one coming in. And uh, tell me what you think it's going to take for Alabama to beat Auburn. Offense, defense, special teams, all of it, if you would. Well, first off, defensively, you have to come up and meet Carrion Johnson. This is a very dynamic back. I know a lot of Auburn fans would love to have Cam Pettway healthy, but Carrion Johnson is a load. He can touch the ball 30 to 40, 50 times a game, and it doesn't appear like he's getting tired. Legs continue to go throughout the duration of the game, can catch the ball out of the backfield, has a little bit of that Le'Veon Bell-esque quality to him, Le'Veon Bell, who plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers, but you see the patience, the vision, the power, as well as the speed from Carrion Johnson in open space, so you're an Alabama linebacker, Rashawn Evans, Keith Holcomb, whatever the case may be, or whoever the player may be, you can't just wait on Carrion to get up the head of steam coming up down the field, you have to go meet him head on and take away his angle. Also, Jarrett Stidham getting hot at the right time. A lot of Tiger fans, did, it was a question to see would he be the guy that could really make this Auburn offense jail when you talk about you know guys in the past like a Cam Newton or a Nick Marshall, those dual threat running quarterbacks that add that element of surprise to that Auburn offense. You didn't really know if Jarrett Stidham could add that, but with his arm, he's been able to bring that 
vertical pass and attack to the fold. So getting pressure to Jarrett Stidham will be key. And, and also, some of the Auburn receivers are starting to step up. Darius Slayton had a critical catch in that game against Georgia where he stops and uh, snatches the ball in, rolls into the end zone. So defending the likes of Darius Slayton, Nate Craig Myers, Ryan Davis, who is a speed demon when it comes down to those tunnel screens, getting those guys off their spots is going to be critical offensively for the Crimson Tide, continuing to establish the run game, uh, getting that run game going. When you have Damian Harris and Josh Jacobs and they're highly involved, they can pick their spots, they showcase that burst of speed and power. Those two can be very difficult to bring down. And, of course, bringing Bo Scarborough Scarborough along while you can. I know he's still kind of favoring that leg injury from uh, the national championship game against Clemson back in January. But if you can continue to kind of bring him along, get his confidence going, that'll be huge. Uh, Jalen Hurts continuing the progressions he's been making the last couple of weeks and uh, getting those big-time throws will be key. And on special teams, not thinking too much. That There have been times where J.K. Scott has thought a little bit too much about placing the punt instead of just going out there, doing his thing, and booming the ball 50 to 60 yards downfield. So not thinking too much on special teams. Offensively, having that run game going. Uh, and also, Jalen Hurts continuing to make the, the big passes, leading that team with his arm. And defensively, meeting Carrion Johnson in the whole getting pressure to Jarrett Stidham. And then also these Auburn receivers, they have their moments where they can have a big game. So limiting that is going to be in the forefront of Alabama when it goes to Jordan Hare. But that stadium, crazy things happen in that stadium. So you can't get too high. You can't get too low. Yeah, that's exactly right. I've seen a lot of crazy stuff going on there. And uh, I don't know if we'll have another uh, any more of that kind of crazy stuff going on this time, but uh, w- we're going to find out here in a couple of weeks. It won't be terribly long. Now, before we continue on here, I'm going to take uh, an aside for just a minute to uh, talk, uh, mention the games that are coming up this week. Uh, this will air uh, before uh, the games this week, and then we'll talk about Auburn on this uh, on the SEC yesterday and today, next week. But as far as Mercer uh, versus Alabama and the University of Louisiana Monroe at Auburn, uh, what what do, what do you think about that? What do they need to do? What do they need? Both teams need to do to avoid a letdown. And uh, they go ahead. Well, I think the main thing, Bird, is just continue to play to the standard that you have. I understand it's difficult to get up for these types of games because it's not an SEC opponent. It's not a big-time non-conference opponent. I mean, the sisters of the poor can beat any of these two schools. So the fact that it's not a big-time opponent, you still have to find a way to get yourself up, get yourself prepared, get yourself ready, and play under that type of a standard. Number one, going out there, executing your game plan on offense. These are the type of games, Bird, where it's less about the opponent and more about yourself. How can I get myself ready, myself prepared, you know, my players to do what, yep. what they're supposed to do, handle your job, yep. and be effective in it, and uh, not have the mental errors, the penalties, the turnovers, most importantly, the injuries, knowing injuries are inevitable, but trying to keep yourself healthy. And, and this is the main part of, if you're able to get out to a big lead on a Mercer or in Louisiana Monroe, in Auburn's case, getting your starters off the field, giving them rest, making sure that they're prepared for the next game, which is a big game, but at the same time, getting your second, third, and fourth string guys some experience because they're going to need that down the road. So along with this game being more about you as a team, being effective, reading your keys, playing to that standard, at the same time, getting your starters off the field when you can, and getting your second and third team guys, your guys that don't really get that much playing time, that experience, so they can draw off that for games to come. And like you said, it's more about your team than about theirs. And, you know, the thing that has uh, 
really impressed me as much as anything about Nick Saban is his ability to get the guys to focus and to bring intensity and to do the little things, to pay attention to details week in and week out, year in and year out, and to win championships uh, like he's been able to do at Alabama has been nothing short of amazing. I, I just uh, year in and year out over how many years now? Uh, he's, in, he's in about his 11th over on the capstone. Is, is that right? It, it, it is. His, this is his 11th year. And that that's a lot of time to be doing it, particularly uh, starting in uh, 2008 after that first year when they, uh, won the SEC, they won the SEC West and went undefeated but weren't able to beat Florida. Then they came back in 09 and did it, and, and, and they've won championships uh, time and time again since then. So I think we need to take a hats off to them. It's uh, – it's it is truly amazing. I probably untis, uh, unprecedented, really, in the history of college football. And uh, so, what's he going to have to do to uh, keep him off of the rat poison this week? I think Nick Saban continues to just do what he does in the <laughs> sense of going at the media, as always. And and Saban, Nick Saban doesn't hate the media. There are times where he goes off on his rants and he kind of gives us a smile or gives us a slight little wink to the side, knowing that he's he does this to get the attention of the players that. We have to take every opponent seriously. I don't care if it's Mercer. I don't care if it's USC or an SEC opponent. You take every opponent play, opponent team that you're going up against in a serious manner because you want to have your best game no matter what. And I know it's difficult at times for players to go up against non-conference teams that don't have the same amount of talent. You're like, well, we can beat these guys, and this should be a no-brainer, and this should not be a challenge. but you got to have within your mind that these guys, though they may not be on the same level as you, they're going to give you their best game because to them, playing Alabama is their Super Bowl. To them, playing Auburn is their Super Bowl. So they're going to wake up in the morning, you know, wash their face, brush their teeth, put on their best uniform, and come out and play you like they're playing against the New England Patriots or somebody like that from an NFL perspective. So what Nick Saban does is continue to reiterate to his guys that, we're trying to make an opportunity to get to a Southeastern Conference championship game because he still holds that SEC title game in high respect, but also uh, make a statement and get to the college football playoff. And it starts with taking Mercer seriously, playing Mercer well, and uh, continue to develop your attitude, your focus, your identity as a football team while you're playing Mercer And then going to Auburn with the mindset of this is a rivalry game, yes, but it's still about what do we do? How do we respond in practice? How do we take this practice? How do we go about the practice? And then how do we go about executing things in the actual game where where, uh, Gus Malzahn and Auburn are going to be on the highest uptick of scales? The Auburn fan base is at a point where, you know, a cup walk during the time where Auburn lost to LSU, who lost to Troy. Nobody had Auburn in this position. And now weeks later, you look at an Auburn fan base that's going, holy smoke, we beat Georgia. If we beat Alabama and beat Georgia again, we're making a case for the college football playoff as a two-loss team. So uh, you being Alabama, having your eyes razor sharp on beating Mercer, but more so ever getting yourself physically and mentally prepared to play an Auburn team that truly knows what lies ahead of it. Yes, that's right. And uh, I tell you what, let's go ahead and take a look at those games this week and make predictions, and we'll close with allowing you to uh, make a prediction from the Alabama side on the Iron Bowl. How does that sound? That sounds fantastic. All right, let's go after it then. Uh, Let's start alphabetically right at the top, Alabama and Mercer. How do you see it going? Alabama takes this game in a runaway, very focused. Nick Saban will play a bunch of players in this one, but I believe the first string goes in there, does what it has to do, stay focused. No injuries this week, but Alabama takes this one. Yeah, they should beat – Alabama should beat Mercer, and they should beat them badly. Okay, Arkansas and Mississippi State. Oh, this is a good one. I mean, as much as I would love – as much as I would love – It is. Brett Bielema to get off the snide and come back and beat Mississippi State. I don't see it happening. Nick Fitzgerald, Eris Williams, and that state defense handles Arkansas. This is a Dan Mullen team that had Alabama down to the wire last week. Honestly, 
probably believes should have won the game and for the most part played like it should have won the game, but Alabama pulled out the win. But I, I got Mississippi State over Arkansas. Yeah, me too. Even though the game is in Fayetteville, uh, Mississippi State has a, as we uh, saw again this past Saturday night, has a darn good football team, and they should be able to go uh, take care of business in Fayetteville against an uh, Arkansas team that is fading fast. And then we come to the uh, other half of the Auburn and Alabama deal. Uh, Louisiana Monroe coming to the Plains. Go ahead. Auburn takes care of La Monroe. This is the tune-up for Alabama. Gus Malzahn knows it. Kevin Steele knows it. The whole team knows it. They'll take care of Louisiana Monroe, but their eyes are fixated on trying to win the SEC West by facing Bama in the following week. But Auburn over La Monroe. Yes, that's a, I am in 100% agreement on that one, as I think most people will be. And here's an intriguing game. Bill Clark has brought uh, this UAB program back and is winning, and they travel to Gainesville, Florida this week to play the Gators, who are very much on the downslide. What does it look like to you? Oh, man. You, you got you to gotta take your hat off to Bill Clark. This team is 7-3. and three. UAB getting its football program back from the depths of the dead. <laughs> And, and how these boys are playing, Florida really struggling. As much as I would love to call the upset card, I would love to pull it right now. I'm not going to do that. Florida finds a way to win, but it will not be a blowout. Florida Gators by five. I hear you. I am. I have waffled on this one, too. UAB is such a great story, and Clark has done such a great job, and I want to pull the trigger, but I, in Gainesville, I don't see it. I know they're going to give them their best game, and I know Florida's down, but something in me just uh, thinks that Florida is probably going to get back on the uh, winning side in this particular game, too. And now off to Athens, Georgia, where the Kentucky Wildcats visit the uh, Georgia Bulldogs, who are licking some wounds there, uh, Stephen. At the beginning of the season, Bird, I I literally pegged Kentucky to win the SEC East. Had a lot of high hopes. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of high hopes for the Cats. In my mind, my thought process has always been when you officially give Georgia your heart, when you officially when you officially love Georgia, that's when they mess you up by not winning the games they're supposed to win. In this sense, though, after a loss to Auburn, where you know Georgia had a chance to really show that they are the legit number one team in the country, did not get that done. They take on Kentucky this week. I think they get that uh, that vengeance. We're well, not vengeance of Auburn, but vengeance of that loss. And Bulldogs take care of Kentucky. I think they do too. They, uh, they, you know, the funny thing is they don't have to beat Kentucky. They're going to Atlanta, but uh, uh, this certainly got their attention. The Auburn game last week, and uh, they can probably step back up and correct their mistakes and beat Kentucky and Athens. I feel like they will anyway. I agree. And the Tennessee Volunteers, with uh, Brady Hoke now at the helm in the interim, are going to be hosting the LSU Bengal Tigers. What do you think, Stephen? Even with the new brick-by-brick notion of Brady Hoke, no more Butch Jones kind of saddened about that. But even with Brady Hoke in there, I got LSU. LSU found a way to beat Arkansas last week. Darius guys ran wild. And and this this is an Ed Ogeron team that, despite you not being able to understand but every fifth word that comes (laughs) out of Ed O's mouth, he's got these guys playing on a motivational level where – they love playing for him. And yes, motivation can only do so much. You have to have the execution. You got to have the X's and O's panning out, panning, panning out for you on the field. But these guys are playing with high energy for Coach O. And uh, they played Alabama tough. They played so many teams tough this year despite losing to Troy. I like LSU over Tennessee. Yeah, I do too. And uh, I like Coach O as well. We call him uh, – uh, uh, y'all, y'all, y'all football, you know, he's, uh, he, he, he is tough to understand. I mean, the, 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 sto- the story of him just eating just complete coleslaw for months is hysterical. <laughs> like he, he's going to the Popeyes and he's giving his children all the fried chicken, but his kids don't like the coleslaw. So he has a coleslaw diet for about a month and a half. I'm like, how can you live off simply coleslaw? Only Coach O. Holy cow! That, that, that does sound like only Coach O. That would get ooh, that would get old. I and mean, then when you go to Popeyes to be able to resist that chicken too, that's uh, that takes some kind of self control. <laughs> All right, let's take it down to uh, Oxford, Mississippi. Another good game shaping up. Uh, uh, even though these teams are uh, 
they, they don't have a shot. Uh, they've had, they've both had disappointing seasons, and uh, Kevin Sumlin, uh, it, well, not just Sumlin. Uh, Matt Luke, too, also at Ole Miss. I, I don't think either one of those coaches are probably going to be around next year. So what do you think about this particular game on the field, Stephen? Ooh-wee. I love Coach Sumlin. I really do. I really, really do. But I'm mm-hmm. going to give this one to Ole Miss. I'm going to take Matt Luke and the Rebels in this one. These players understand that for the most part – you really don't think Matt Luke is going to get the interim tag removed off him and be the head coach. But these guys with Jordan, uh, Tamu at quarterback filling in for Shea Patterson as he's done for a good portion of the season. I feel like this defense led by Marcus Haynes, Demarcus Gates, and Breland Speaks are going to play for Coach Luke Hard. These receivers, uh, running back Jordan Wilkins, who's healthy, completely healthy for the first time this season and probably the first time in his entire entire career I like Ole Miss it's it, it's too much off-field stuff going on at A&M when you talk about the nasty letter that was written to Kevin Sumlin of course his wife read that and that was I I, I, I hate it when, when that happened and then it, the, huh. the fan base when, when you talk about Texas in, in itself the fan base when you're putting all money into a program so much money being put into your your facilities your your, your athletic venues, just so much money going into Texas A&M. These, this fan base believes that it should be on the same par with the Alabamas, the Auburns, the LSUs. And because it's not on that same par winning-wise, they believe that they deserve to be on that same par. Kevin Sumlin has not been able to get it on that same par since the Johnny Manziel era. It, it, it's been difficult. So I'm going to go with the Rebels. Well, we're agreeing again. I'm going to go with the Rebels, too, at home, even though they don't have Shea Patterson. They, uh, they've, they've won a couple of games in a row now, and they've got a little momentum. And uh, since the game is in Oxford, that may be the deciding point for me because the game is at Ole Miss. But as you mentioned, a lot going on off the field, a lot of distractions at A&M, and I think Ole Miss can step up and take this one. Uh, let's go to Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, where the Vanderbilt Commodores host the hot, now the hot Missouri Tigers. Go ahead, Stephen. Any other time, I would pick Vandy in this game. Uh-huh. Derek Mason in that defense, but Barry Odom, maybe he's found the pot of Blue Fojo. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> Barry Odom's found the pot of Blue Fojo. I mean, <laughs> Drew Locke is not a bad quarterback. Demario Crockett could run the football pretty good. Jamon Moore is a pretty darn good wide receiver. Defensively, they need more guys to step up aside from Marcel Frazier. But maybe Missouri's found the pot of blue, blue Fojo under the radar. I'm picking Mizzou. I'm low-key picking Mizzou. M- Mizzou by one. Mizzou by one. Uh, I hear you. Yeah, I, I like Derek Mason, and I think he's doing a credible job there. He's a, He is, as you mentioned, a defensive mind. But, boy, Missouri has just been scoring points in by the dozen. And I feel like this game somewhat like I did about the Florida game a couple of weeks ago. I just don't think that Vanderbilt can score enough points to beat Missouri. I think Missouri is going to score punts. I don't know if they're going to get 50 again, but they're going to get enough to beat Vanderbilt, I do believe. And before we uh, get back to the Iron Bowl, let's wrap up the SEC picks this week with Wofford uh, going to Columbia, South Carolina. Go ahead and give Will Muschamp his eighth win of the year. <laughs> Will Muschamp, South Carolina, get that done. And, and, and just what a job done by Muschamp. I know a lot of people don't see him as a big-time SEC football coach, but you're at South Carolina where not very much is expected from you, out of you, and he's done an unbelievable job. You're 8-2, and two, and you're doing much of this without Debo Samuel, who you lost for the season, a guy that at one point in time when he was healthy was 50% of your offense. He's no longer here. or it's not, we're not, He's no longer playing for the rest of this season due to an injury, but you've been able to incorporate Hayton Hurst and a lot of other guys in. Jake Bentley, though he can be erratic at times, a strong quarterback, somebody that's got a lot of confidence and his arm, his leadership, and his ability. The defense is playing pretty well. You got to take your cap off to uh, to Will Muschamp. 
Yeah, you do, and they should uh, they should handle w- Wofford easily. And that brings us right down toward the end of our program, and we'll take it back to the Iron Bowl, uh, Alabama coming to Auburn, and give us a prediction from the Alabama vantage point on the big one coming up, Stephen, if you would. This is going – this is going to be a tough one, Bird, and I'm I'm looking to probably more than likely be at Jordan Hare for this Iron Bowl. I'm gonna probably be on the edge of my seat in the press box. I might have to say a couple of prayers to uh, Oh Jesus for before this one takes place. But uh, man, this is going to be a good one. But I, I I got I got Alabama, but it's going to be tight. I got Bama 31-27. All right. I, I do appreciate That's it. That's going to be a tight one, 31-27. It's, it's going to literally come down to which defense gets the marquee stop. Yeah, somebody's going to have to. It's probably going to be one of those uh, barn burners again and coming down to the very end. And the points scored, I think there will be a few. Uh, few. You've got 31-27, and I don't think it's going to be a low-scoring game. I think both will get a handful, but it's probably – could come down to the last series again, and I'm going to give my pick uh, next week at this time. So, Stephen, we do appreciate so very much you coming home. It's been a great joy to meet you and to uh, have you on the SEC yesterday and today. And if you would, why don't you tell the folks out there where they can find you on social media and so forth. Other listeners can find me on Twitter. I'm at smith underscore T-D-A-L-Mag on Twitter. Uh, once again, that is at smith underscore T-D-A-L-Mag. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, that being Stephen M. Smith. Uh, the site that I write for is Touchdown Alabama Magazine, in which we cover the Crimson Tide from all facets, all angles. You can find that on, on our Facebook, Touchdown Alabama Magazine and also Twitter at TD Alabama Mag. And also, I host a radio show weekdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Central Time called The Way It Is, Fox 97.9 FM, in the Muscle Shows, Florence, Alabama area. Uh, Fox Sports, uh, not Fox Sports 97.9 FM, The Way It Is, weekdays from 2 to 4. Check out that when you have some time. Okay, we'll do that. And, of course, you can find me, as usual, on Twitter at Autull, A-U-T-U-L-L, my personal website with sports and personal blogs, birdlacroix.com, also at campuspressbox.com, and this podcast under the Sports Hacks title. Uh, You can find us there, the SEC, yesterday and today. And this has been Episode 10. We appreciate you listening. Be sure to take care out there and love your neighbor.